So, Brian, welcome. Welcome. Really well, uh, nice to have you here. It's good to be here. Um, you were saying we have small dealers, we have medium dealers, we have large dealers. Yeah. But this morning I already heard three times that you are a pretty big dealer. You're the largest Honda dealer in the world. The yes, that, depends on how you look at it. I'm wondering is how do you become the largest Honda dealer in the world? What, well, well, I think you, what's I, the magic? I think you hit it right. I mean, it's the mindset. And the mindset is, you know, it's what, what is important to you? What do you see? You know, your role and your vision really determine where you go. And, uh, my, my colleague that's here with me today, we went to a university last year. I'm 58 years old. I'm still going to university because there's so much new to learn. And you can't, the, the amount of information that we're getting and it's changing every day, we'll never be able to keep up with it. But you have to keep yourself relevant. And the mindset, they, they said, what is the definition of leadership? And um, a lot of people didn't get that right, but I, you know, I, I did. I, it's, it's vision. Leadership is vision. So if, if you're a leader of your business, your company, your team, your organization, what, what is your vision? And, and my vision is to be the number one at everything that my manufacturer measures. That's gross profit, that's net profit, that's sales volume, that's customer satisfaction, that's innovation, uh, that's um, working with some of the biggest retailers in, in the country. And that, that, that's, I think, is the most important thing. Okay. So the mindset, can, can you say that in, in one sentence? What is the mindset? What, what makes the, you well, well, the mindset is, you know, uh, I'm a little, I'm, I'm awake now, right? The mindset is, are you a hunter or are you a farmer? Are you a hunter or are you a farmer? And you know, the, the, the farmer waits for the food to come up out of the ground. And he sits and she sits and they wait. And the hunter goes out and they get the food. You, you've got to eat it, you've got to be hungry. And you know, I know uh, there's cultural differences. I'm an American, you know, and especially now we've got this president. Don't, that's not my fault. Uh, it, it's, there's a, there's a, the, uh, he's doing some good things, but there's, there are cultural differences. But one thing that's not different uh, is that uh, the, you, you have an opportunity, an equal opportunity to get more. And I think you, you need to take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, there's, I asked, you know, I know you have a social system here that protects everybody, and that's great. But you do have bankruptcy here. And some are big and some are small. And, and, you know, so I think equal opportunity is incredibly important. Equal outcome is not guaranteed to any of us. There are some that are stronger, there are some that are weaker. There are some that are smarter and some that are smart. There are some that are uh, more handsome, there are some that are less handsome. Uh, you know, there, so there's no equal outcome guarantee, but there is equal opportunity. And I think if you give me an equal opportunity, I'm going to eat somebody's lunch. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> or breakfast. I mean. Or breakfast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, so, so the, 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 the difference, the hunter and the farmer, the farmer waits for the crop to come up, right? I think you have to be both the hunter and the farmer. I like to say that uh, with young people like Julian and other people, you, you plant the seed, and the seed grows into a tree, and the tree gives you shade. And if you continue to nurture the soil, the tree gives you fruit and you can eat from the fruit. But it takes a long time, and I can't wait for the tree to grow to eat the fruit. I've got to eat today. So you've got to have that balance between um, hunting and farming, or short-term and long-term thinking. And I think the best of us have a plan for what we're going to do tomorrow and in the future, and, but we also have a plan for how <coughs> we're going to eat today. Uh, I visited uh, your website uh, yesterday. Uh, okay. One of the most interesting things I saw is that you sell cars online. Yes, of course. Um, in the Netherlands, we don't do that yet. We have a uh, few players doing that. We have uh, Auto.nl uh, here in the room, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, one okay. of the most innovative uh, players. We okay. have Carnex now. Uh, I saw the Carnex now uh, set up over there. Yeah. They're hunters. They're, they're, really, they're, they're hunters. really are hunters. And, and, and what's going to happen is you, if you put, just think if you put a predator in a non-predatory environment, that predator is going to get more. And predator sounds like a bad word, and, and, and it's not. It, you know, we're in business. I'm not here to see that the other person survives. I'm here to see that my team survives, and, and not just survives, but thrives. We have to do it in a fair manner. We have to do it in a legal manner. But you know, we, I think you're entitled to get all that you can get. But what, what, uh, why did you make the decision selling cars online? Well, of doing it well, well we no longer go online, right? We, we live online. Everybody, you know, most everybody has a, a cell phone, and, and it's just easier for people to do business uh, online. As a retailer, uh, I always wanted to get in people's pockets. You know, I wanted to get this. 
today I don't want to get this. I want to get this. Because everybody has this. Everybody doesn't have this. So I want, I want to be able to get to, and communicate with the customers the way that they're communicating with us. And, that's, and that would be by getting on a, on a cellular phone. It, it's, um, you have Apple here, right? Okay, so, so Apple, you can go to the Apple store. Well, I don't, I don't know. I just assume, I assume certain things. And then they, yeah, I, I asked somebody, they have Google here. Oh, and the gentleman said, we don't use Google. I'm like, okay, I want to open a dealership next to his. Uh, because if you're, not, if you're not using Google, I, I will be using Google. Uh, and he's going to say, why is there all this traffic at that store? Well, you know, Google is a pretty good platform, and it's going to get better. Um, uh, but, but, I, but I think the, the opportunity for us to reach more customers has never been greater than it is today. Yeah. And this is no longer reserved for the rich. Uh, this is, this, everybody has this. So, so this platform is fantastic. Telecore online is a way to easier get to... Custom customers are going to do what's in their intelligent self-interest all the time, irregardless, irrespective of what you think they should do. You may want them to come into the store to go through your 10-step sales process, if you have one. The customers, if they don't want to do it, they're not going to do it. If they can avoid it, they're going to avoid it. So I, I want to put the quickest or the, the shortest distance between intention and outcome that I can, without thinking like a car, sale, uh, car sales manager. I have a sales process in the dealership, uh, opening investigation, selection, demonstration, verification, appraisal, close, TO, and I can tell you what each step is and what you're supposed to do with each step. I didn't ask him to shake my hand, but he did, because it's spring-loaded, so I'm taking control, and I would ordinarily shake my head like this, and he'll start shaking his head like that, and, and, and next thing you know, he's buying a car. I, I, I had that. But, but how do you do that here? I can't, it's not shaking my hand. You know? So you've got to come up with different ways of taking control or putting a customer in a funnel. Or more importantly, how about giving customers shared control of the process? But we, we have Uber here. I established that yesterday. What do you like about Uber? What do we like about Uber? What we like about Uber is I can pick the driver. I can pick the vehicle. I can pick the color. I can pick the size. I can look at the driver's record and say, oof, several people said he smells bad. I'll pick a different driver and pick a different driver. I can pick the location I get picked up at. I don't have to fill in all that information. So, so I have shared control of the process. Uh, and I, I think to the extent that we can give customers shared control of the process, give up some of that control, that we can have more business. And, and you look at, you've got an online platform. Uh, you're, you're giving up some control of the process, yet you own the process, right? You built the mousetrap, uh, but the customers get to think that they're part in control. And they can, they can opt out. They, they have the ability to say, I'm out. They tap out anytime they want. So we've got to make sure there's no friction in that. Yeah. <clears throat> so I have two more questions, uh, and then uh, we'll give it uh, to the rest of the, the mm -hmm. audience. Um, yeah, so... A shorter process and a, a big hurdle now in the process is the negotiation of car prices. Uh, you have different car prices in your showroom uh, compared to the prices you offer online. Uh, at least that's what your colleague uh, Julian uh, told me, that you offer a, ca a car online, for instance, for 19000 while you offer it in the showroom for 20000 but the showroom pricing is negotiable. Is that a correct summary? You want the click to match the brick. You want what's online to match what's in store, to the best of your ability. You have the ability online, uh, I mean uh, in store, to negotiate a little bit differently. You have the ability in store to start out at a different price in the United States. Mm -hmm. but, but the online pricing and the in store pricing that a customer will see on our kiosk are the exact same. It's the exact same pl uh, platform. And you, we want to make sure that the click matches the brick. We want to make sure that this experience matches what happens when they walk in the store to the, to the extent possible. And in used cars, for example, and Julian's right, with used cars, the price you see online is the price you see in the store. There's no negotiation. There's no negotiating because I can tell you this price is the best price within 100 kilometers of a dealership. Would you like to buy it? No, I want to negotiate. You can't. This is the best price. What would you like? It is the best price. You want to pay more? We can do that too. But this is the best price. Here's the data that supports that. And, and the transparency sets you free. We uh, forever had no transparency in this business. We, we play with our cards like this. And we have these, you, I say we, but many of us have inexperienced salespeople negotiating. 
And that's not to our advantage. Uh, why not build a process that has transparency? I think um, I was speaking with a gentleman before, Eric, and he was saying that you know many times customers don't want to buy a service because they feel that they're being upcharged or oversold. But what if I showed you a picture of your engine's filter and you saw all the fuzz and fur growing on that filter? You, you, you would understand that that's going to harm your engine. You won't need me to explain it to you. I saw, uh, sadly, for the first time in many years, uh, we were doing a demonstration for Google of how our online service process works. I saw a cabin filter and an engine filter. Both were hairy, furry, uh, and you looked at that and said, oh, you wouldn't have to ask me twice to replace those. So by providing greater transparency to the customer, the customer will buy more. It's, it's uh, rather than trying to upsell the customer, just show them. You know, we understand a clogged air filter in this air conditioning system, A, is gonna burn out the motor, and B, it's not good for our health. The same thing is true for a car, and most of us already know that. Yeah, so transparency is a key word. When huge, it comes to huge, huge, yeah. And can you give some of the examples on how you are more transparent than uh, your competitors are? Well, everything we do is online. Uh, you, you know, the customers are not going online for information, I don't believe. Customers are going online to conduct business. Uh, many people, it used to be that you called a BDC uh, to get information, and many BDCs make appointments. I don't think people are calling to make an appointment. I think they're calling to do business. And if we look at it a little bit differently, uh, then you might see that you, you can actually do business online. Google <clears throat> tells us that there's a, uh, uh, nearly a one-to-one -one correlation between search and purchase. So for every 100 people that search for a car, 89 people in the States buy one. For every 100 people that search, 89 people buy one. Yet in our stores, we think that selling 20% of the people that walk in the door is a good job. And the reality is that it should be more like 70, 80% the closing ratio. So I think by providing the transparency, we can do more business. We started looking at what are the big retailers doing in our quest to double business. And, and, and so we do a pretty good job against the other Honda dealers. By the way, are there any Honda dealers here? Yeah, there were no Honda, yeah, besides you, there, we saw two Hondas so far, I've been here now um, 26 hours, we've seen two Hondas, one was in a museum and, and one was on the road. What's happening with Honda? I, I, I want to be a Honda dealer here, I won't bother any of you, you can't say I'm stealing your business because there, no Honda, there is no Honda business here. But if I set up a little Honda shop someplace here, we're, we're going to do business because I'm, I'm a hunter, I'm hungry and I want to figure it out, and I want to show all of the people in the Netherlands, why don't you like Honda? Let me show you how it compares to, I see Fiats, Volkswagens, are you kidding me? The Volkswagen store across the street from us, we, sell ten, we outsell them 10 to one. So, but, but here, it's, there's 10 Volkswagen. Volvo, Volvo beats Honda, never. Mazda beats Honda, never. Toyota, the Toyota dealer in my market, we spank them, we spank them. There are three Toyota dealerships in our market. Our store outsells all three combined. Because I'm hungry. And I don't want to hear the data that Toyota sells more than Honda. You say that. I think Honda sells more than Toyota. And I sell more than Nissan. You know, you, and, and I'm not nasty. I'm not, I'm not mean. I just think I, I've got five kids. And they want to go to school. And they want to live in nice houses. And they're millennials. They don't want to work. So I've got to help them with that. <laughs> And I was so good to hear that millennials here are the same as millennials back home. I, I, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't, what is, what is e-sports? What is e-sports? We heard yesterday a presentation, and the gentleman's not here, a wonderful presentation that people actually go to view people watching video games, by playing video games. Now, now, I like to watch, when I was a kid, Michael Schumacher in a Formula One car, because it, he's going into a turn at 190 miles an hour, and he could die. I thought, that's really exciting, and oh my god. Somebody playing a video game, I'm gonna go, it doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, yeah. it, it's, like, what, it's like talking about work is not the same as working. You've got to work, you know, and, and, and talking, or, or playing a video game of, of your racing a car is not the same as racing a car. It's just, it's just not, in my opinion. So. So great to see the mindset come alive. Oh, yeah, it is. It's, it's, and it's really, I'm activated. My time, my time clock's off. But uh, we, we, we think there's a, uh, some of the, the opportunities. I'll give you a quick overview of some philosophy changes for us. We looked at um, 
Last year, 2017, in the United States, 6,000 businesses went out of business. 6,000 businesses in a very good economy. I mean, by, by all uh, standard measures, you've got relatively low interest rates, although they're rising. You've got very low unemployment in the States. Uh, you've, you've got a stock market that, even though it went down 600 points yesterday, is still up 5,400 points since uh, Trump took over. Uh, it's a you know, relatively all-time high. You had 6,000 stores go out of business. Well, what, why is that? It's 17 a day. That's you know, one every two hours. You know, since we've been here, another business went out of business in the United States. And the reason, I think, is because people are not going to retailers anymore. They, they expect something different. Amazon's business in the past 10 years is up 1,900%. 1,900%. That's a good day, <laughs> 1,900%. Many of the other retailers, uh, Sears, no, Sears is out of business. Nordstrom's, uh, Lord & Taylor, uh, any of the, the stores you may know in the States, uh, they're all experiencing 40 and 50% drops in business over the past 10 years. So it's not that people are buying less, they're just doing it differently. We looked at what does Google do? Google has search. And so you search for something on Google, and then Google gives you the answer, and you go there. Amazon does it the exact opposite. Amazon, you search, and Amazon brings a product to you. So instead of you going to the product, Amazon brings a product to you. And I thought, what if we did this with our business? What if we, instead of waiting for the consumers to come to us, what if we went to the consumers? And we proposed this to Google, and Google said, yes. And I said, I want to sell cars. I want to bring my cars to the customer. And Google said, yes, we agree with you. Let's do it together. Start with service. I said, no, 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 I'm, I'm a sales guy. And, you know, I, I do service too, but they said start with, and they, they gave us this term called LCD, which is lowest common denominator. Go with the biggest platform first. And I'm realizing, as an automobile dealer, we never, we never did that. Look at Facebook, LCD. What they wanted to do was to give everybody Facebook for free and get it out there to as many people as possible then they can monetize it. So Google said, let's get this platform for service, as many people as you can get servicing, and let's give the customers an opportunity, if they want, where you'll pick up their car for service, service it, and bring it back. Now, one thing, I said this yesterday, and it's true today too, none of you in this room are using your car right now. None of you. So what if you had to have service? Wouldn't it be good to have someone pick up your car, service it now, and put it back before we had to leave? If you needed service, of course. And could we do more service business if we did that? So the answer we think is yes. We developed an application, the first ever on the planet, where you can use voice technology to have a pickup and delivery of a car. And it won't work now, of course. But um, if I said, talk to Paragon Honda, Let's get Paragon Honda. This is Paragon Honda, your car dealership in New York. Would you like to book an appointment for a car service? Yes. Sounds like a plan. Is this for the 2017 Acura MDX? It knows I have one. Yes, it knows I have one. No sweat, your 2017 Acura MDX. I've got your contact details, but I'll need a few more things. Will you need a loaner car while I have your MDX? No. No. No loaner then. Where should we pick your MDX up? At my office. Okay, what's your my office address? 5702 Northern Boulevard, Woodside, Queens. Paragon Honda isn't responding right now. Try again soon. I'm sorry. Uh, they're supposed to respond right now. They're not open. But the, 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 the object of the game, the object of the game, and I, I, try, I didn't try it all the way through here in Denmark, but the object of the game is to be able to do this without touching the phone. And you may say, wait a second, this is easier to call. It's easier to call to book the appointment. Well, no, it's not. It's actually, in the United States, it takes eight minutes to book a service appointment. We can do it this way in two minutes. And when you do it using voice technology, I'll get a text confirming the pickup and delivery of the car. I'll get it put on my calendar, my Google calendar. It gets put on the service department's 
schedule it for work. And the more important thing is when we pick up the customer's car, bring it back to the dealership and service it, the average repair order is twice as high, or, or the average bill is twice as high as when they service in the dealership. So when you take the friction out, the actual bill is twice as high. I was sharing with Eric some of the data for us, and, and I'm, I'm not um, selling anything. You can't buy anything from me. You can buy a Honda, that's it. I'm not, selling, uh, I'm not selling a platform. I'm not selling an app. I'm not selling a widget. I'm just sharing with you our experience. Um, the, in 20, August of 2017, we picked up 600 cars for service, serviced them, and brought them back to the customer. This was, we started this in um, May of 2017. So by the end of August, we had picked up 600 cars, serviced them, and brought them back. One year later, we picked up 1,900 cars in August of 2018, serviced them, and brought them back. So we had a 300% increase in the pickup and delivery business. There's more good news. The actual profit per transaction was 100% higher. So can you imagine that? We had the gross profit margins of Ferrari with the volume of Toyota. And we thought, that's really special. Well, and, and now that we've got this LCD or this platform, we can now take the same customers if they want to test drive a car and just use the same technology to send the car to them to test drive. If you like it, you can keep it. We'll send you the bill. Or we can send you another one. And, and, and to sell cars, like your, your company's doing, like Carvana in the States is doing, a number of companies are doing pickup and delivery. And we think this insulates us against, um, against the Amazons. If you, they say if you play tennis with a better tenor, tennis player, you get better. If you run with a faster runner, you get faster. What if you, instead of looking at the dealer across the street or down the block, uh, instead of looking at that retailer, what if you looked at Amazon and said, I want to do business like that? What if you looked at how they're growing and say, I want to grow like them? And, and, I, and I think when we started changing the way we measure ourselves is when we started to get some really incredible increases in our business. And we don't think we took business from anybody else. We think we just recreated business. We're getting a lot of the business that's there. Um, in the States, and I hear it's similar here, the independent service departments are grabbing 70 to 80% of your service business, the independents. It's not because they're less expensive. That's what we've been taught. It's because they're more convenient. So, and, and their proximity is closer to where the customers live. So the customer can drop the car off at the gas station down the block, and then they go to work, and they come back, and they pick it up. And we tell ourselves, because it makes us feel better, it's because they're less expensive. Maybe they are, maybe they're not. If we can pick up the customer's car while they're servicing, while they're at work, service it and put it back, are we entitled to make a little bit more money? I think the answer is yes. We took it a little bit one step further. We started picking up customers' cars at night when they're done with the car, servicing it overnight and putting it back in the driveway before they go to work the next day. Because everybody goes to sleep sometime. And why not do the service work while the customer's sleeping? Uh, we opened our shop up 24 hours a day to accommodate the additional work. And we did that for two days a week, then three days a week, then four days a week. Now it's five days a week. And isn't it fun that we've been able to increase our service business without adding any more fixed overhead, any more lifts, any more brick and mortar? So, so almost 24-7, or 24-5 available? Yeah, 24-5. Yeah, and, and, and you know, you've got to have two days to clean the darn shop. You've got to clean the place up. And it's, it's, um, it gets messy. Uh, and it's, it's a good messy. It's a busy messy. It's not messy messy. It's busy messy. So that, that, that messy is okay. So let's hand it over to the, to the people that we have in the room, because I think a lot of people here have questions. Um, who wants to kick it off? Okay, let me give you just a little bit. Uh, some, some people that uh, say, wait a second, wait, 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 wait. I, yeah, this is too much for me. This didn't happen overnight for us. It was crawl, walk. We started in 2017 on the two-year journey. It's, my two years is up, and I'm not anywhere near done. So there was a lot of level setting. Uh, so, so I don't want someone to think, well, you know, we, we're not a, a store that size, so we can't do any of this. I think some of the smaller stores have a, a great advantage and a great opportunity to be able to do that. This question is from someone in the automotive finance industry, uh, the banker. Uh, the, the finance penetration on the sales, is there a difference in at retail, so the showroom sales, and online, do you see a difference? 
The, um, the statistics are pretty similar. The, the math is the math. We, we think if you control the money, you control the customer. We think it's, when we had a conversation with Mr. Lumen yesterday, it's extremely important to control the financing of the car. We control the financing in 90% of all of the transactions at the dealership. That's whether it's a lease or it's a finance. Uh, you control the money, control the customer. Uh, it, to the extent possible, and I understand there are different markets, but uh, I don't want my customer going to an outside bank to obtain financing. When they do that, uh, A, I don't control that transaction. They can go to the bank, and the bank may have an arrangement with another dealer and say, don't buy it from him, go to her. Uh, and, and, and the other thing is the bank doesn't care if they buy a Honda, a Toyota, a Nissan for the next time. So when the customer wants to get another car, the, the bank may refer them someplace else. So I want to make sure that I, I can control that. Uh, but, but to answer your question, th there's not really a big difference. Uh, people need money, um, whether they're financing online or in the store. And we think if our offerings are competitive and fair, that they'll choose our offerings. And how many hours does it take? How many hours for what? To get the financial uh, things done. It's um, how many minutes? It's how many minutes? It's how many minutes? Yeah, it, it's probably about five minutes to get a, an approval for a loan. Yeah, five minutes. Yeah, it, 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 hours? No, 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 no. There's too much information da data out there. You know, the social security number, date of birth, uh, uh, and that's about it. And I can get a decision in about thirty seconds. Uh, if, if, there's, if your credit's not good, that can take a little bit longer to massage. And there are a couple of transactions that take a day to get the approval, but the vast majority, and, and, we're, and we're building this for the mass, vast majority, uh, we can get the, the loan information in, in minutes. In minutes. Yes. All right. How do you go for trade-ins that people want to buy online? How do you deal with trade-ins people want to buy online? Well, um, uh, we have auctions here, right? Yeah. And you have auctions, you have people that buy the cars at the auction online? And what he meant is when you yeah. sell the car. Oh, I, I understand what he meant. I completely understand what he meant. Hey, do, 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 you have, do, you, do you have people buying cars online at auctions? Uh, in the Netherlands? Yeah. There are some. Okay. There are the, some of the famous auctions, Barrett Jackson uh, out in the States, they, they're buying Highline cars uh, and they have online buyers because right, right now today you have never you've never had more ability to have pictures of cars and and you, we have Carfax in the United States I don't know if you have that here that gives you vehicle history reports so we just tell a customer to take a camera everyone has one now and take some pictures of your car walk around the car we we used to say that it's so different every car has got to be judged on its own yes and no a Honda Accord 2010 with 35,000 miles. Well, there's a high and a low, right? If it's a 2010 with 35,000 miles, there's a high, great condition. There's a low, bad condition. Uh, assuming no frame damage, assuming no structural damage to the car, you're in that range. Now you're giving me some pictures. I have a very good idea of the condition. So I've narrowed that range down even more. And, and, and the same as you would do in person. What used to be the artiste was the used car manager. And it's no longer the artiste, right? It's a commodity like anything else. I can hang a number on the car. If you sent me a picture of a car, whatever the car is, I can tell you what that's worth, plus or minus a couple of dollars in uh, New York today. And, and again, somebody may know that product better and may say, no, 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 this is a Volvo with this package. It's worth a little bit more. You're right. But for the most part, we can get that number narrowed down. Yeah, so I have two questions. One out of the 10,000 cars you sell, what's your online share? And secondly, um, how is your uh, dealership organized uh, versus the traditional dealership? And I'm not talking about uh, uh, all the technology, but actually for people. Okay, so two good questions. How many cars do we sell online? Well, um, the an there's a bunch of answers, right? Uh, the, an the easy answer is 85%. Wait, 85%? 85% of the transactions start here. That's online. Maybe the question you're asking is how many transactions are completed from cradle to grave without anybody coming into the store? And that answer is 1.7%. 1.7%? That's terrible. No, it's not terrible. It's great. The national average in the States is less than 1%. So we're ne nearly double that. But then there's somewhere in between what's happening. We, we have a... a, a Closer to 20% of the customers are going through three quarters of the process online and then saying, I still don't trust you. I'm going to do all of this. 
but you're not getting my money so I can see my car and I'm going to come into the dealership. That's okay. We're going to get there eventually. And think of it this way. Think of when you go to the airport. You go to the airport uh, uh, in the States 15 years ago. You go to the airport and there's 20 people behind the counter and there's two kiosks and there's a person there at the kiosk offering to help you. And, and, and think of what that looks like today. Today there are 20 kiosks and there's nobody behind the counter. And you've got to check your own bags, and you've got to get your own boarding pass. I, you know, I think a lot of we're going in that direction. It's going to take time before people trust us. In the United States, people do not trust car dealers. Uh, but I can look at you and say, mm, he may be lying. You lose that ability online. So sometimes customers don't necessarily trust us because we're online. In fact, they may trust us a little bit less. So they'll go through most of the, they'll go through most of the process that gives them what they want, and then the, when, when it comes to getting what we want, the financial information, the title to their trade, they, they tend to do that inside the store. But we're, we're encouraged by every month there's a few more customers going through the portal uh, every month. Uh, we think that number would really skyrocket if it was a Honda online buying process, if it was a Toyota online buying process, if it was a, a Google online buying process, it would give us the credibility. The customers would understand that if something goes wrong, I've got some recourse. And, and so we're encouraging, but the one thing I am selling is for the manufacturers to listen to us and for us to join with the manufacturers in having an online platform to sell cars. And then the gentlemen, the, the, the people that are independent uh, brokers doing this won't stand a chance because we'll have the financial arm the process, the computing, and the data uh, to conduct the transactions. But right now, until uh, the OEMs get involved in this, we're going to continue to have these upstarts like Carvana and these other companies come in and, and little bit by little bit start picking away at our customer business until there's not enough business there for us to stay in business. Yeah, because you're facing a lot of new competition with uh, Carvana. You, you're facing, do, do we understand what's going on? In, in New York City, Honda deal went out of business. Acura deal went out of business. You don't have Acura here. Uh, Nissan uh, went out of business. Volvo went out of business. In one of the wealthiest cities in the world. Not because they can't afford it, but because it's a bad business deal. Uber, if you drive less than 11,000 miles a year, is less expensive in New York City than owning or leasing a car. So people are always going to do what's in their best interest. I don't need to own a car. In New York City, you have three payments, right? You have a car payment, you have the insurance payment, and you have the garage payment. And for those of you that have been to New York City, you have also the fourth, a, a ticket. You're going to get ticketed <laughs> once a month there. And the ticket's $150 plus. If it's a tow, it's $600. It's a headache. All I have to do is just say, Uber, here, pick me up here. Boom, I go to my destination. Boom, I get... I go inside. It's, it's, it's killing mass transit in New York City. So you, you talk about disruption. The city is now trying to outlaw Uber, not because of anything other than people aren't taking the subway. I don't want to go in your stinky subway, New York, that smells like urine, and you've got homeless people there. I don't want to do that. And it takes me not where I'm going. It takes me from here to here, but I've got to be here. So I've got to go from here to here and then walk here. I, I can just go directly. Uh, an Uber. I don't want us getting your bus where it's, you, you pack us in there like sardines. And I know the tran mass transit in, in Europe tends to be much more friendly and it's much more widely accepted. It's, it's not, you know, there's nothing friendly about a New York City subway. <laughs> there's nothing friendly at all about that. Yeah, we know that smell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and people smell, I, I get it. But, you know, if, if you have a choice to spend less, go exactly where you want and avoid the smell, well, sometimes you do. Given uh, uh, the example you just gave about Uber and uh, those trends, if you uh, could start all over again with your age right now, and you see these trends uh, in this business as a dealer, would you start all over as a dealer, or would you choose a different? You use the word threats. I don't. I see them as opportunities. Uber, why not sell them cars? They buy cars more often. How often do the Uber drivers service? Once a month. They service at 5x what your regular customer service is at. So, you know, I, I, I can't answer the question honestly because I don't know. Would I get back into the business now? Hell no. <laughs> it's a tough business. But you ask any of the, uh, an athlete, would you do this all over again? You ask an, a boxer, would you 
do you want your son to be a boxer? Hell no, because you know it hurts to get hit in the head. And, you know, and, and what we've done now hurts. Every day you wake up and there's some new story about something, right? The stock market dropped 600 points. You say, hey, come on. Uh, and and uh, Uber comes out. But I think there are opportunities if you look at them as opportunities. If you're going to demand that they do business, your customers do business the way they did yesterday, we're in trouble. I, I like to look at the uh, Bezos of the world. Bezos, let me, why is he so special? Why is he a, 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 a company worth a trillion dollars? Why is he so special? What did he invent? Did he invent the internet? No. Did he invent Federal Express or UPS, pickup and delivery? No. He started out with books. He started out with books. And, and so I, I think it's encouraging. What he did was he leveraged the stuffing off of the existing technology. Every person in this room can do the same thing. There's never, I mean, so somebody asked me, if you were a car salesman today, how would it be? And I, I, I can answer that easier than I can answer the dealer question. To me, if I was a car salesman today, I would be the predator, predator, because it's never been easier to reach more customers. I used to write out a thousand postcards a month by hand and send them out to every prospect I had. And I developed ways of doing it. You were my prospect, and I, I put your name on, a, on a, a piece of paper, and I'd, I'd write out your name and your address. And then you're my prospect. On the same sheet of paper, I'd write your name and address. And then you're my prospect. I put your name, and you're my prospect. So now I've got four names on a piece of paper. I'd give that to my printer. I'd say, give me 36 of these pages. Cut. So I take the 36 pages. They cut it into four. I now have 36 postcards with your address, with your address your address and your address. And I get 36. So every month I would just fill out one of the postcards. So nice to see you, good to see you again, happy spring. And, and every day I'd sit there with my headset on, answering the phone, thank you for calling Paragon, this is Brian, how can I help you? As I'm writing out my postcards, happy spring, happy spring, I just put them aside. I had a thousand to send out, so that's you know, 30 a day times 30 days, you know, it's 33 a day, no big deal, and send them out. The problem with salespeople today is they send out the 33 postcards and say, okay, where's the business? It doesn't work that way. You know, it doesn't work that way. It's not instant attribution. It takes time. But over time, you start sending out 30 a day, and six months go by, and they say, who's this nut sending me a postcard every month? I had customers walk in with six postcards and say, OK, I'm ready now. <laughs> hey, OK, got it. And what are you doing this for? And there was no sale. It was a conversation. So I, but that was back, back then. I say, today with the internet, right? The internet, I put you into my CRM. And, Bam, 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 bam. I'm going to look you up on Facebook. I'm going to send you articles that you're interested in. Hey, you're a soccer player. Boom, did you see the goal last night? Did you see Germany kicked Norway's? No, no the, the, the Germany lost, right? They lost. I mean, but, but I'm going to send you stuff that's interesting right now. I'm going to send out something in, in a blog to all of my, uh, my customers. I'm going to send out interesting videos of, hey, did you see that we got the brand new? And I can send it out to everybody for the F word. Do they have the F word here? Yeah, they do. Free. Free, the F word. There's no excuse not to do it. There's no excuse not to be able to communicate with your entire database every week, every month, whatever the cadence is that you, you like. So, so in answer to that question, as a salesperson today, I, I'd own it. I don't. You just gotta, you know, uh, work. And we, we spoke before. Nothing works till you work. You gotta work a little bit. It's okay. I've got calluses on my hands. It's all right. So this, this predator mindset and. Uh... This sounds like something you have it or you don't have it. You, no, you, it, you develop it. Nobody, I mean, you're not born a predator. Little babies not sitting there saying, ah, I'm going to kill. No, I mean, you know, yeah, it's not, I mean, I hope not. Good Lord. No, but, you know, little baby sits there and realizes, you know, initially you cry. Well, this is the problem with millennials, right? When you're a baby, you cry. Mommy gives you some milk, right? Okay. Uh, they're 25 crying. Mommy's not supposed to be giving you milk at 25. You've got to go out and get your own. And how do you make sure that, you, that, that the people work with you? Surround yourself with, you've got to surround yourself with like-minded like people. You know, you, you know, you've got, you know, you try and find out what turns that person on, right? And some people, it's the big house with the swimming pool and the picket fence. Other people, it's, you know, they want the fancy cars or the watch. Uh, I, you know, in the United States, our social security system will not uh, sustain you. So sometimes you've got to use a little fear. Hey, what's your plan? What's your plan? You can't make it six weeks without a paycheck, right? You can't make it six weeks without a paycheck. What are you going to do if you retire at 65 and you screw up and you live till you're 95? What's your plan for 30 years with no income? 
And, and I'm sorry to bring that to you, but you gotta start thinking about that now. What's it cost to send a kid to college in the United States of America? I learned after the first couple of kids. My, my, we, we had a couple of kids, and, and, and my wife has another kid, and I know, well, that's gonna be a quarter of a million dollars for college, so I gotta, I've gotta earn a half million dollars to pay the quarter of a million dollars. So every time she had another kid, it's like, hey, 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 bank. Uh, here we go, uh, and, and you, you start, you, you know in advance, prepare for it in advance, and so part of, part of that's it. Uh, the other thing that's really good is social proof. Hey, I did it, you can do it. He did it, you can do it. We did it, they can do it. If not me, I'm not a smart guy. I, mean, I, I, I didn't go to college till many years after I was already in business, because I, I was insecure and I wanted to have that diploma on the wall. I got it just for the heck of it. I don't use it, uh, but, but I've got it. Uh, I, 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 and I like to say, hey, I, I was able to, anything that I wanted to accomplish, I could accomplish in our business. And to show them, um, how many billionaire soccer players do you know? Zero. How many billionaire rock and rollers do you know? Zero. How many billionaire actors or actresses do you know? Zero. I can name 15 billionaire automobile owners. Dealers, dealer owners, from a Roger Penske to the gentleman we met yesterday. I, I don't know if he's worth a billion dollars. I saw his dealerships and I said, boy, I hope he is. It looks like he is. Uh, I, I know, uh, 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 this, yeah, I said Roger, I said the, the, the guys that, um, it was uh, uh, Mr. Um, uh, Galpin, the Galpin, Bo the Bolkman family over in uh, California. Then you've got uh, Rick Case. Uh, is there, then you've got uh, Rick Case's wife flies a plane, has 5,000 hats. Uh, then, you know, it's just, it's just, I don't know if you know or read a case, it's kind of weird, but she said, uh, but, but the, these, the, the, these are first generation billionaires. So I try and teach our salespeople, stop looking up to Ronaldo. Hey, he's great, he's got a couple hundred million dollars, okay? What's he gonna do when he can't play soccer anymore? I can do this till I drop dead, and I'm going to till I drop dead. And, and I, you, we can out-earn. What's an athlete, a f pro football player in the United States of America? You know how long their career is? Seven years. 82% of professional footballers in the United States, 82% file for bankruptcy within two years after retiring. And, I, and I'm, I'm not even looking at retirement now. So I start to tell them about, hey, if you pay attention, this is what's in it for you. You'll never play basketball like Michael Jordan, but you can learn this business like the best in the business. Any more questions? Otherwise, I'll just keep going. No, I have a question. In the market here, uh, the used car is becoming more uh, important profit margin-wise. Uh, I imagine it's the same uh, in the US. Can you share some of your most profitable sales strategies for used cars? Um, I'm in the manufacturing business. I manufacture used cars. And that's a, that's a really interesting thing for us to do. You see, I, I think the gentleman's got a business that, your, your used car business is, you, you buy cars from the auction and every place else? No? no you, I don't own cars. You don't, what's that? We don't own cars. We have a platform in our showrooms with other people. Super smart. I mean, because you leave the non-profitable part of it to us. Great, thanks, appreciate that. Um, uh, but, 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 but we do own cars, so what are we gonna do? And, and so we, we, we like to think we have trade cycle management, that we're manufacturing used cars. And if you were gonna manufacture a used car, would you like it to take a long time or a short time? Oh, I'd like it to take a short time. So what we do is we lease a lot of cars. We lease the cars because we, we, we know the number one thing determining customer loyalty is not whether you send them cookies, not whether you're really nice, but the length of the contract. The, the shorter the lease or leash, the more loyalty you have. The shorter the leash, the shorter the term, the more likely you are to do business. So we always say, or we have a saying, that uh, if you want to eat a lot, eat a little. What do I mean by that? I went to a Tony Robbins seminar 20 some odd years ago, and Tony Robbins said, picture a man, 300 pounds. I want a picture of a man 300 pounds. Okay, 300 pounds. Okay. Picture of a man 300 pounds naked. Oh, God, 300 pounds naked. Okay. Picture a man 300 pounds and 90 years old. And you can't. You know why? There are none. They're all dead. So if you want to eat a lot, eat a little. And you can eat a little and live a very long life. But if you eat a lot, you're going to die before you get to 90. And I said, well, that's interesting, okay. What if it's the same thing with the automobile business? If you want to eat a lot, eat a little. 
And instead of trying to make $5,000 a transaction or $7,000 a transaction, and I'm all for that, but what if you eat a lot? A little, but you, eat, you do it a lot. So what if you took a, a trade cycle management, and instead of making $5,000 on a five-year contract, where you only have about 60% chance of getting the customer back, what if you made $3,000 on a two-and-a-half-year contract? And you got to trade every two-and-a-half years that you can sell. And what do you make on a new car? What do you make on a trade? What do you make on the service? We, we, we figured out that that's the most valuable transaction we have in the dealership is one where a customer takes, gives us a trade-in. We call it a vehicle exchange. And if they do a vehicle exchange, we sell the new car and we make a profit. We sell the used car and we make a profit. We make a finance profit on the new car. We make a finance profit on the used car. We make a service repair order profit on the trade-in. We put the value to that vehicle exchange transaction at $7,200 per transaction. The total value is 7200 And these are actual statistics from our database. So you've got to know your numbers, right? What is your most valuable transaction? And what you, know, the, you as managers and dealers and uh, as salespeople need to know what, where your highest return is. And if you can have a transaction that gives you $7,200, the only question now is how many? And where do I get those? Where would you get transactions that give you trade-ins? Where would you hunt? Well, i got a couple places. I'd go hunting. You gotta know where to hunt, right? If I go out there with a shotgun looking for, for food, I'm not, well, I could, yeah, you could hold somebody up, but you gotta know where to hunt. So you have a service department, right? Every person in your service department has what? One of your cars. So you just walk up to them and say, hey, you know, I met with the owner yesterday, and I, I don't wanna interrupt you, but the owner asked me, um, he said to let you know, he wants you to know that I can take you out of your current car, give you a new car, and lower your monthly payment. I'm not trying to sell you a car, but he thinks it's our obligation to let you know you can drive a nicer car, better technology, safer, for less money than you're paying right now. You're not interested? Okay, no, no, that's fine. So in other words, you want to keep the older car with the not as good technology and pay a higher payment. You sure you're okay? And, and, and if you will make that presentation to 10 people in the service department, you will sell 10% of them a car. And if you have 100 people a day going through your service department, you can sell 10 cars a day in the service department. How much advertising cost is there associated with that? Not one dime. And if you do that transaction successfully, for us, that's a $7,000 overall transaction. And if you do that, you get the trade-in. So I created you as a customer, and now I've got a trade-in that I'm going to sell to him. I've just created two customers with no advertising expense. And that is the best way we know to geometrically increase your business. I'm not going to the auction. Who, how do you buy a car at the auction? You have auctions here, right? How do you buy a car at the auction? You pay the most. Hey, I won! Hey, yeah, you paid the most, stupid. Oh, oh I didn't win. And, and, and every time you go back and you see those guys, they walk around like, look what I just did. You just spent the most money on, on those cars. Good for you. I, 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 the, the guy that's in the service department, you're competing with nobody. You're not bidding against anybody. And you can tap out at any time. No, I'm not going to give you that for the trade. You're crazy. So it's, really kind, of, it's kind of fun. And, and, and then you can repeat that. You have a DMS, right? All of us have a DMS. In that DMS is all the data you need to become super wealthy. How many customers are in that database, in that DMS, that are in equity? You, you need to know that number. And then if, if that number is 1,000, you've got to come up with a plan to contact the thousand. So, so then that's where I go to like these, to outsource these BDCs, to get somebody to, to go after that data in the database. And, and, and I can tell you right now, approximately 9,876 customers are in equity in our database right now. 9,876 customers in our database where we can take them out of their current car, put them in a new car, and lower their monthly payment. I'll give you the math because I know the math. If we could convert 10% of them, that's 980 cars a month. Extra. No advertising cost. I can give you the math because I know it. At the end of the year, that's $71 million in gross profit. $71 million gross profit in a year. If I strike out nine times out of 10. If I miss nine customers out of 10, and I'm, if I miss nine customers out of 10 that are in equity, what I just said to him, if I can take you out of your current car, put you in a new car and lower your monthly payment, are you interested? No. And I do the same thing to him, no. All I need is one person out of 10 to say yes, and it's worth $71 million. 
and we all, all of us, no matter the size of your dealership, you all have a database, and you all have customers in that database that are in equity. And so when you say to me, yeah, but my customers keep the car a long time. Uh-huh, give me that database. Give me that, they're all in equity. Uh, they're all in equity, and I'm gonna find the right car to match up to them. Now, I'm not saying, it's not easy, because to get to 9,876 customers, you've gotta make probably two and a half phone calls to reach them once. And so to get 10, you've got to make 25 calls to get one, but, <coughs> but it's worth it, I think. Yeah, so getting to the point then of marketing, because uh, I think we have only a few uh, minutes left. Uh, CRM. This happened CRM yesterday. Because I, I, uh, you, you're talking to me about, this is like talking to me about something that, you know, I, I really like. No, so, we're so. doing great. Right, so okay, okay. okay. Uh, I think another part of marketing is advertising. So can you tell me anything about your advertising strategy? Which platforms do you use? It's really good. Like? It's really good. It's really, really good. What platforms do I like? I, I like? I like the biggest pipes possible. I like uh, Google. I think Google is, you know, and I, I'm still learning how to use Google, but you know, I think that the Google AdWords are great. What, what's your plan for what's coming? Because voice technology is taking over everything. What's your plan? Uh, many of us really still haven't mastered AdWords, and the next iteration of that is going to be voice. Hey, Google, what's the best price on a Honda? How do you get your name to come up? He's in Honda dealers. Uh, what's the best price on a Toyota? The uh, best price on a Toyota, which Toyota? The Camry. The uh, best price on a Toyota Camry can be had at, you know, at, at Dan's uh, uh, Toyota in, in the Netherlands. Uh, would you like to talk to them? How do you get that to come up? Uh, and, and what's going to happen with voice? Voice technology is immediately leading to voice and visual, where you do a search and you're going to get an answer, not just a voice answer, but you can get a video coming back. I can tell you this because we've seen it. I can tell you this because Julian, I, I, I'm with my, my, my colleague here. He doesn't sometimes even realize that he's seeing stuff that nobody in the world is seeing. We're in the Google Labs there, and, we're, and we, we, we're looking at stuff, and they're making, they called my assistant, Jennifer, at 3 o'clock in the morning and said, get that off your computer. What? Get that off your computer because she had the presentation on, on her laptop, and they said, You're, that's like having tomorrow's newspaper. And you can't have that. We can't let you have that. And so we've got a, a real good look in the future. And you're going to see uh, screens now everywhere inside cars so that when you talk you, and you ask something, you're not only going to get an answer, but you're going to get an answer and a description. And you can deeper dive into that, which is great. You know, how do I pair my phone? You can not just get the answer. You're going to get the answer and you're going to get a visual. And then would you like some help from a dealer to do that? The cars, of course, will be talking to your dealership, hopefully your dealership if you're connected. Uh, BMW is doing it now, somebody pointed out. But when the light goes on in the car, it's going to say, hey, your light's on. Would you like to have that car picked up and serviced to Paragon Honda? How do you make sure you get your name there? And this is not, to your point, to, to, you don't throw in the towel. This is where you get excited. If I learn this technology before anybody else, I can own it. And they, they say the illiterate of the future will not be those that can't read or write. It'll be those that can't learn, unlearn, and relearn. If you've never, if you have nothing to unlearn, you've got an advantage over someone that's got, you know, that knows all the things that won't work, right? Don't we all know those dealers that'll sit there with their arms folded and they'll tell you everything that won't work? And you say, hey, Johnny Negative, is there anything that does work? Okay, good, let's talk about that. You know, that won't work here. This is the Netherlands. He doesn't understand this market. I, I, he doesn't understand. Oh, yeah? Give me a little while. Give me a budget. Give me a little while and give me a place to the storefront and let's see what we can do. I think a uh, final question, and if we don't have any, I'd like to give a big applause to Brian. Thank you. Th thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thanks.